This is footage of the world's first elevated electric railway, created in one of Britain's busiest port cities to solve a growing problem. It ran for 11 kilometres and carried around 20 million passengers every year. And it was a high-tech solution to an age-old problem and set the standard for elevated railways around the world. So where did it go and why did they get rid of it? At the end of the 19th century, Liverpool was a bustling port city with a huge dockland running the length of its riverfront. The problem was, it wasn't just busy, it was busy busy, bordering on chaotic. With thousands of dock workers moving in and around the city, a transport solution was needed that would serve the entire length of the docks. It would need to be quick, cheap and congestion free. The answer the city came up with was radical daring and perfect, the Liverpool Overhead Railway. Throughout industrialisation, Liverpool's dock traffic grew at an incredible rate. Not only did shipping increase, but ships were bigger than ever before. As the docks became overcrowded, and in many cases too small to cope, new dockland was added, then more and then more. With all this Dockland, the problem now wasn't congestion on the water, but congestion on the land. Moving goods from dock to warehouse and vice versa created traffic. Then you add in the thousands of workers who had to go to and from the docks all day long, and you've got a major problem with overcrowding. The Dockside Railway was added in the 1850s to speed up the process of moving goods from ships to warehouses. But initially, only horses were used, not locomotives and by 1860 they were ferrying passengers along as well as goods. The idea of an elevated railway was introduced early on as a way of establishing an extra transportation link along the dock front without affecting the road. But there were concerns. Steam engines were heavy and produced a lot of smoke and ash, which could be dangerous for anyone walking below. Still, the Liverpool Overhead Railway Company was formed in 1888 with the aim to further a double line railway along the city's front. And rather than steam, the company decided that electric trains would be the better option. Electrified trains weren't exactly new, but they were rare. And they'd never before been built to run elevated off the ground. After nearly four years of construction, in 1893 it was finished. Built from raw iron girders and standing almost 5 metres off the ground, the line ran from Alexandra Dock to Herculaneum Dock, a distance of around 5.5 miles. Where it crossed wider street sections, bridges were built, four in total, while the engineers included hydraulic lifting sections at Brunswick, Sandon and Langton Docks, for goods to be lifted to and from the line. At Stanley Dock, a unique double-layered bridge was built to carry road and rail traffic over the Leeds-Liverpool Canal. There was both a lifting and a swing bridge. When smaller vessels wanted to pass, both sides of the bridge would raise up at an angle, while for taller vessels it was possible to swing the entire bridge out of the way. Power to the line was supplied by a generator at Bramley Moor Dock, fed from coal supplied directly from the railway line passing nearby. To reduce the amount of energy needed, carriages were specially designed to be extra lightweight. The new line was incredibly popular with commuters and acquired the nickname Docker's Umbrella because of the shelter the overhead line offered during rain. It remained popular even during two world wars, carrying millions of passengers every year. Not only was it the first electric elevated railway in the world, it was also the first to use automatic signalling, electric units and electric colourful light signals. It also became something of a tourist attraction, with a poster from the 1930s calling it the best way to see the finest docks in the world. An extension to the main line was built at Seaforth in 1905, eventually allowing for passengers to make through journeys to places like Aintree and Southport. 
Finally, an extension in the south at Dingle took the line a short distance inland. It meant the overhead line suddenly became an underground line thanks to this tunnel. The station at Dingle was here, on this corner, and passengers would have the strange task of descending from street level in order to access a largely elevated railway. So, if it was so popular and useful, why did it close? Well, large parts of the line had been damaged in World War II, and the line was never nationalised like the rest around Britain in 1948, and so suffered from a lack of funds. Also, as motor cars became more popular, travelling about the city by train wasn't as appealing to workers and shoppers alike. Additionally, by the 1950s, those strong iron girders had begun to age, and in some places deteriorate. The line suffered from rust and wear, and repair costs were quickly mounting up. Facing a bill for around £2 million, the Liverpool Overhead Railway Company appealed for funding, but finding none went into voluntary liquidation. On the 30th of December 1956, and despite much public protest, the line closed forever. By 1958, all sections of the line had been demolished, with very few bits of evidence remaining of its existence. Even the Stanley Dock Double Decker Bridge was replaced by this one, the foundations of the original barely visible. Elsewhere, footprints of the cast iron columns can be seen in this wall at Clarence Dock while the tunnel at Dingle remains a tantalising reminder of the engineering marvel that was once here. Although it's no longer with us, today the overhead railway is a source of great pride and nostalgia for Liverpudlians. It's been nearly seven decades since its demolition, which is a longer time than the railway even existed, yet its memory is overwhelmingly a positive one for the city. Even if the overhead line had found its funding and survived the 1950s, it's unlikely it would have sustained itself much longer, as the decline of the Liverpool docks in the 1960s, 70s and 80s meant that the number of dock workers fell steadily over this period. The overhead would simply have run out of customers. And by the time things were looking up in Liverpool, a new Merseyrail mainline extension had been built, rendering the need for a line along the docks a bit useless. Now would this engineering marvel ever return? Probably not, but as 21st century cities continue to suffer with congestion, innovative and high-tech solutions are being looked at again. It may not be the last we see of an elevated mass transit line on Liverpool's waterfront.